Let's go Raptors, we the North! This message right here, this says victory in Japanese. We already won. That's why we're out here. <laughs> two down and two to go. Raptors beat the Warriors to take a 2-1 series lead in the NBA Finals. Although last night's game was in Oakland, as you just saw, a lot of our fans were in the stadium cheering the boys on. Greg Ross joins us live now from the Oakland Bay Bridge. And Greg, you caught up with a group of fans who made the trip like you down there. And that's a great shot, buddy. Yeah, we, I mean, we are seeing a Canadian invasion. And yeah, it is a great shot. That is the Bay Bridge. That's the bridge that you see featured on the Golden State Warriors logo. And uh, this is where the fans wanted to be today. We met up with many of these fans at the game last night. You just showed the footage. Many of them sticking behind after the game. The security was trying to get them out of the building, but they stayed and they sang O Canada. Then they joined us outside of the arena. They sang O Canada some more. They were chanting, they were cheering, and then they got up early this morning to meet us down here at the Bay Bridge because they said it's time for Toronto to take over. Yay, yeah, man, that's super. Slowly but surely, Raptors fans trickled into Rincon Park in downtown San Francisco. <laughs> Their meeting place at the base of an iconic bridge. Do you know what that bridge is right there? Toronto's new uh, newest property in uh, Oakland. <laughs> it's actually the Bay Bridge, which connects San Francisco to Oakland. It's also featured prominently in the Golden State Warriors logo. But these fans say now it has a new name. A Jurassic Bridge. <laughs> oh, yeah. They made sure everyone knew where they were from. Our home and native land. And the country is well represented here, with Canadian fans from coast to coast converging on the Bay Area. Toronto, meet Alberta. Let's go. Let's go. Ricky, let's go. Finds Van Vliet. Torontonians all too happy to share their team with the rest of the country. You know what? It's not Toronto's team, it's Canada's team. We the North. Let's go. Let's go. How about that? Oh, I love it. It's you. Know, it's, what a better way to, to unite a country than to follow behind, follow behind the Raptors? That's it's exciting. These fans also a perfect showcase of Canada's diversity. I think it's the most beautiful thing that Canada is encompassing of so many nations, so many people. Let's go Raptors, we the North! Yep. Mainly about how the Raptors have all brought us together. Yep. Look at the diversity just in this small sample yep. of 40 people, 30 right. people, you know. To be able to bring my kids to watch this history making time for the Raptors is incredible. What was your favorite part about that game yesterday? Um, well, Raptors winning because it's like the first time in history they've ever made it to the finals. Wow. He says his favorite moment was the Raptors winning. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah. The Toronto Raptors come to Oracle and they take the game. Gasol from downtown. They hope the Raptors can win two more, which would earn them their first NBA championship in franchise history. Let's go Raptors, we the North. Let's go Raptors. And it's incredible. Just walking down the streets here in San Francisco. You see so many people from Toronto. People were just walking by, taking our picture right now. Well, we've seen fans from all over the country uh, stopping to say hi when they see the CBC logo. Uh, you know, we saw Jack Armstrong from the broadcast crew going for a run this morning. And we also saw people coming from other parts of the United States. A family from Texas stopped by to tell us that they're also supporting the Raptors. So it's true what they say, that everybody outside of California wants the Raptors to win. So. They may get their wish. The Raptors up two games to one now, Dwight, uh, and game uh, four of this series goes here tomorrow night. We're told that more fans are going to be coming. In fact, we saw somebody tweeted out a picture from a plane that landed here in San Francisco today, and it was filled with people wearing Raptors gear. So there could be even more in the Oracle Arena for game four tomorrow night, Dwight. It looks like you Canadians are having a great time down there with your winning team. A whole bunch of us are going to come down and join you. Thank you, Greg. Now, while there were battles on the baseline in last night's game, there were also battles on the sidelines. Swatted away, Ibaka Lowry diving into the seats to save it. There's no place in it for that. You know, he had no reason to touch me. He had no reason to reach over. 
two seats and then say some vulgar language to me. There's no place for people like that in our in our league. And um, you know, hopefully he never goes comes back to an NBA game. Kyle angry and being vocal after he was shoved by a Warriors fan during the fourth quarter. He was attempting to save a ball from going out of bounds, and it wasn't just any fan. The Golden State Warriors identified him as team investor Mark Stevens. Soon after the shove, he was ejected from the arena, and late this afternoon, the NBA fined him half a million dollars and banned him from all NBA games and Warriors team activities for a year. The Warriors had earlier banned Stevens from going to the remainder of the finals, Kyle Lowry had more to say about what happened just a few hours ago. I think, you know, more should be done. You know, I don't think a, he, he's not a good look for the ownership group that they have. And, and, and I know Joe Lake, those guys are great guys. The, the ownership that they have that I know, they're, they're unbelievable guys. But a, a guy like that showing his true class and um, he shouldn't be a part of our league. It's just no place for that. Can you confirm what the guy said to you to go blank yourself? Is that accurate? Yeah, multiple times. Yeah, it could have gone the other way. It definitely could have gone bad. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm bigger than him as a person. Uh, my kids are more important to me than he is to me. So I got to make sure that I always, you know, think for my kids first. And, and that's what it's all about. It really is. Meanwhile, back here in the city, Toronto fans are battling for merchandise. Raptors, everything is flying off the shelves. Paul Morelli, Morelli joins us now from Real Sports. I want to come down there and do some shopping myself. There's some left behind your fire, but I'm going to say those are all XLs that can't fit anybody. Uh, not XLs, double XLs. <laughs> uh, Dwight, uh, sweatshirts like this, awesome sweatshirt, East Champs, double XLs, slim pickings. Stuff is, as you said, flying off the shelves, and it's bustling in here. I want to give you a peek of the lineup to uh, pay right now. There have been times where there were lineups to actually get into the store, and I've been told that there were actually a couple days where they were out of jerseys entirely here. They just got them back in, Dwight, so if you didn't want to pop back in, they do have jerseys now. Uh, this isn't the only place where stuff's flying off the shelves. I spoke to someone at Sport Check today who said they're actually bringing in merchandise from other cities to Toronto to try and meet this demand. Now, these are all stuff or shirts that you can buy. But the one thing you can't buy are these. These are the shirts that you get at the playoff games. These are the shirts that are on the seats that are for free. And today I actually met the man who makes these. Uh, he's been working with the Raptors for four years. Uh, he says that uh, it has been obviously a very busy time for him. And he's not getting a whole lot of sleep these days. Hey, how's it going? Good, thanks, Chaz. All right, nice to meet you. Come on in. Can we get the full tour? Definitely. So this is where everything happens. This is where it happens. This is our screen printing department where we print all the t-shirts for all the games. There's a huge pile right over here. That's right, huge pile there. Game We've five? Sorry? For game five? For game five. Um, super excited for that as well. Hopefully it's the winning game. So how does it work with the design? They, they're switched up every game. Do you guys come up with that or is it the team? No, that's the team. That's definitely the Raptors and MLC and their creative team. And their marketing team is hard at work creating the designs. So in this case, we've got the Re the North that we used last game with, of course, the classic Raptors logo on the back. Can you walk me through how the shirts are printed? Yeah, totally. So we take a blank shirt like we've got here, and you can see our Sean, our machine operator, loading the shirts on the press. As he loads them on, they spin on the carousel, they get printed on the screen, and you can see they get finished off here and put through the dryer to cure. And once they're through the dryer, they will last forever. How many t-shirts are you printing a night? Uh, we're printing for the Raptors, we're printing over 20,000 per game. Right now it's our peak season for us, so we're running 24 hours a day. Um, and our third shift actually, around the clock. Around, literally around the clock, and we come in on weekends as we need to, including long weekends. And we've had our office staff and our leadership team also come in and work on the production floor to make sure we're keeping up with production. And how much notice are you guys getting from the team to print these shirts. I mean, it's kind of a fluid situation, the playoffs, right? Yeah, for sure. Right now, the finals are really spaced out, so it helps, we get lots of time. But there could be times where you're turning this around in 24, 36 hours. Okay, so we did have a big win last night. Huge win. I don't want to jinx anything. I'm knocking on wood behind me. Your prediction for the series? We got this. I'll leave it at that. We're going to win this. We've got it. We're taking Six, it the whole way. Seven. Hey, I want it done in five. It'd be fantastic. <laughs> 
Now, Dwight, as Jazz said, he is predicting a win in five. And he told me that uh, he's actually already or will by tonight have finished all of those T-shirts that you saw being printed. But, of course, if it goes to game seven, uh, he's going to be responsible for making all the T-shirts for that because that's a home game. So that's 20,000 more T-shirts that are going to be printed at that factory. So not a lot more sleep on the horizon for anybody in that factory anytime soon. He said in five, I'm saying in seven, but we'd love to have it in five and just get it over with. Thank you for that, Farah. Thank you. It is that time of year, folks. Finally, the Rogers Center roof is open for the first time this season. That's right, it's dome open at night. The Blue Jays are at home against the hated Yankees. As we told you earlier this week, it's been 30 years since that building opened up. And Colette, was it the Temptations that sang, I've got sunshine? Because, man, we <laughs> finally got some sunshine. The dome's open. The boys of summer are here. Oh, it's so nice to see that site. Yes, Dwight. Um, they had it on a cloudy day, though, I think. So <laughs> we've got sunshine on a sunny day. Yeah, it's so great to see. Finally, we can get not only the Dome open today, but the idea that it might be open for tomorrow night's game, too, because we've got a string of good days coming at us. And just in case you're curious in terms of what we're talking about with the temperatures for tonight, game time coming up very, very quickly. Sunshine, 20 degrees we're looking at with those winds out of the southeast, and they're fairly light. We're still hanging in there at 22. Earlier, we peaked at about 23 degrees, and we're right around seasonal, not only for the daytime highs, but for our overnight lows as well. And this, you almost wouldn't know that this is the satellite and radar imagery because so little to see here. High pressure is in place, and that ridge of high pressure, as that is moving in, it's very stable air. It's sinking. It's not causing us any kind of active weather. And so what we get into are the clear skies overnight so that the temperature can fall off, but all kinds of sunshine through the day, a few clouds possible over the lakes. Uh, winds are going to be fairly light as well for a couple of days till about Saturday. Then they'll start to pick up a little bit, but overnight tonight, there you go with your overnight temperature. And tomorrow looking like a glorious day with sunshine, 24 degrees. I can't wait to show you the five day forecast. There is rain in it, Dwight, but I'll show you where that comes. <laughs> Thank you, Colette. You're welcome. A major collection of historical photographs of the Caribbean is coming to our city. It will be housed at the Art Gallery of Ontario thanks to the efforts of our local community. Tashana Reed has the story. One of my favorite um, so far because it depicts a group of Jamaican women. This is only a glimpse of the Art Gallery of Ontario's latest acquisition, a collection of more than 3,500 images and photos that capture Caribbean history. We really want to create a hub for uh, Caribbean photography. The images feature more than 34 countries and territories, including Jamaica, Barbados and Trinidad. AGO curator Julie Crooks says the collection tells a unique story. It is almost a social history uh, through photography um, of the Caribbean. The photos, taken between 1840 and 1940, shows daily life, historic events and economies in a post-slavery era. Many of the photographers and their subjects are unknown. So basically this, you know, sort of shows um, life in Guadeloupe. The Montgomery collection of Caribbean photographs started with the curiosity of this man, New York-based photography collector Patrick Montgomery, who noticed while visiting the Caribbean that few museums had photography collections. I started looking around and asking photo dealers and looking at auction catalogs, and um, it turns out they did exist, just not in the Caribbean. His curiosity turned into a project over a decade long, tracking down albums and photos. A lot of the, of the islands there are, were French colonies and were British colonies, so a lot of the photographs turn up in those countries. Montgomery gifted part of the collection to the AGO, but a year-long fundraising effort by a group of donors largely from Toronto's Caribbean and black communities raised $300,000 to acquire it. Investor and entrepreneur Bruce Croxon, yeah. whose mother is Jamaican, yeah, jumped yeah. on board. I think this is a way, you know, an old school way uh, through a collection of telling a story about a period of time that a lot of people that may know the island or may have even visited might not know a lot about. 
now begins the research phase for the AGO, who plan to connect with Caribbean institutions and experts to help fill in the history behind these photos. They need the kind of history to back them, um, to kind of tell a more uh, expansive, fulsome story. While the exhibit won't be mounted until 2021, the AGO says they plan to host special programming around the collection. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Today marks 75 years since D-Day. We'll show you the ceremonies held in Normandy to commemorate the anniversary. Plus, back here in Toronto, why a Second World War vet was recently given France's highest medal. Had to go on the beach and get off as quick as you could. So you're a knight. I'm a knight. You're a knight. You're Sir George, Sir William George Carpenter. Yeah. Tributes and respects paid to the fallen on France's Normandy coast today to mark the 75th anniversary of D-Day. On June 6, 1944, a surprise sea and air operation turned the tide of the Second World War. Tens of thousands of Allied troops took part, including 14,000 Canadians. Thomas Daigler was there for today's ceremonies. Today's Canadian D-Day commemorations put veterans from the Battle of Normandy front and center. Not only did they sit up front and hear their bravery honored, but the most poignant moment of the day may have come at the end of the ceremony when they were invited to return to the beaches, Juneau Beach, where Canadians landed 75 years ago today. In some cases, these veterans had not been back to that beach for 75 years, an emotional moment indeed. Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister, told them Canadians won't forget their sacrifices. On the battlefields of Normandy, Francophones, Anglophones, Indigenous peoples, new Canadians came together as one. One fighting force standing on guard for their British, American and French allies. Thousands of Canadians made the trip over to France to be here for today's commemorations. Uh, everyone seemed to have a story, a personal connection to the Battle of Normandy or indeed the Second World War and they were eager to share those stories today. My grandfather, uh, he survived uh, D-Day and he survived throughout the war and he came back to Canada. He was able to come here 10 years ago for the 65th anniversary and it was an incredibly emotional experience for him to be back because it was the first time he was back since the war. And uh, he passed away last year so I got asked to attend on his behalf uh, to, to honour his memory. My dad never spoke of the war, he never said a word so never really knew much about it but coming here makes you understand what they went through. Whether it was on the beaches of Normandy or in Holland or Belgium or wherever the front was along the front, for me it's kind of adds closure to what my dad never ever told us. Commemorations continued well into the evening here at Juneau Beach at an international ceremony where representatives from every country involved in the Battle of Normandy, including Canada, Britain, the United States and Germany, they all laid wreaths on the beach where each one of those countries fought many years ago. This could be the last time that so many Battle of Normandy veterans returned to France for commemorations. And as someone in the crowd said today, 75 years ago, they had no fear. Today, their only fear is that what happened here is forgotten. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, at Juneau Beach. And the D-Day anniversary was also marked right here in our city. Many Canadians learned of the D-Day invasion early in the morning. 75 years ago today on the radio. As word spread, Torontonians gathered in the streets and prayed. In fact, they prayed here, right outside the old city hall. 
the early morning ceremony time to coincide with the landing of the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division, including Toronto's Queen's Own Rifles of Canada on Judo Beach. The mayor spoke of at least 50 Toronto residents who died on that day 75 years ago. But he also talked about how thousands of Toronto residents contributed to the war effort by building ships, planes, weapons and making clothing. Also part of today's ceremony, a number of soldiers who took part in D-Day. I'm only five foot two. And I had my rifle up over my head and all the water poured out of it. I was too short to be in that water. It was frightening. When I look back on it now, it was really frightening. These young men would get up and look at the world today. You know what they would say? What the hell have you done with the tomorrows we gave you? But I have hope because we are just a few and we are going to hand over the torch of freedom to the young generation. A second World War veteran has been given a special honor right in time for the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Last month, George Carpenter was awarded France's highest medal for his role in the liberation of France. Angelina King has his story. B134020. After 60 odd years, I remember that. You never forgot it. George Carpenter is 95 and prone to forgetting some things, but says he'll never forget those numbers, his serial number from the Second World War. Carpenter also remembers arriving on Juneau Beach by boat. He was part of a diversion, tricking the Germans into thinking Canadian troops were going to Calais, but really they landed on Juneau Beach about a week after D-Day. It worked. <laughs> the big battleships were there, firing the air. The big guns, too. I was the last one off because I didn't like heights. And I had, I had to go over the side and go down the rope ladder, like down the, the side of the ship. Carpenter grew up in Toronto and worked as a butcher before enlisting when he was 18, following in his dad's footsteps who served in the First World War. Carpenter was a cook and once surprising the troops with chocolate pie. And <laughs> they all had cramps because they weren't used to the rich food. <laughs> he cooked things like stew and bread pudding in a flooded chicken coop and barbecued in trenches. Feed their empty stomach and give them the strength to carry on. That's why he was recently given this medal at a special ceremony and awarded France's highest order of merit. It recognizes honor and bravery in the name of freedom. The French National Order of the Legion of Honor was first created by Napoleon Bonaparte in 1802. I thought being a cook wasn't that important, but after I realized, I felt proud. That pride shared with his great niece and the community of Kipling Acres where he lives. So you're a knight. I'm a knight. You're Sir George, Sir William George Carpenter. Yeah. He just carries on. It's just like when he was in the war, he just carry on. I mean, he's just positive and he's humble. He doesn't think he did anything, but nothing would have happened if they didn't have food in their bellies. And uh, he witnessed lots of things that he probably would prefer not to mention, you know and he left his fears behind. But brought with him memories and stories of how he helped pave the way for freedom. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. Thank you, George. An anniversary like today can be an opportunity to keep stories of service and sacrifice alive, especially for younger generations. So contributors from CBC Kids News met with veterans ahead of this D-Day anniversary to hear their stories. I'm Ari and I'm 11 years old. I met with 95-year-old Jack Miller, who was an Air Force veteran during D-Day. There, there, there's me. <laughs> he explained to me how it felt like joining the Air Force and leaving his family behind to go to war. The Air Force, they wouldn't accept me because I wasn't 18. So I, mother and dad had to sign and my mother said she didn't want to sign it. And my dad says, well, you might as well sign it because in two months he'll be 18 and he's eligible for the draft. How, how are your parents feeling? 
Like, were they oh, scared for you? I think my mother was, I had uh, three brothers. Two of them were in the service. So my mother went completely white haired after I come home in the two years, you know. H how did it feel when, when you knew you were going to war? I don't know, just it, you, you had to experience it. Before you went, you never thought that you were going to be one of those that didn't come back. You don't think that way. It was a comradeship. They were like your brothers. Of course, we have more on today's D-Day anniversary still ahead, including another piece from CBC Kids and why today's Canadian commemoration wasn't held in Ottawa, but instead in Halifax. That's coming up in about 20 minutes. But first... We have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to make meaningful change in the way alcohol is sold, purchased and consumed across Ontario. The province pushes forward with its plan to put booze in more locations around Ontario. More on their latest idea to help serve hundreds of underserved communities after the break. A busy session has wrapped up at Queen's Park and politicians won't be back at the legislature until after the federal election in October. But as Lisa Shing reports, today's final sitting still managed to deliver a few surprises. Order! With that, the last legislative session of the government's first year in office kicked off. We saw plenty of the PC's signature standing ovations and the opposition's finger pointing across the aisle. And what the Premier is really doing is deliberately picking fights and creating chaos. The NDP leader fuming over the province legislating a public sector wage cap, the first big move it's made to balance the budget. And we looked at the books, we found out, surprise, surprise, there was a $15 billion deficit. It's hard to argue the government moved at a dizzying pace toward that goal, but the way they've gone about it has largely been unpopular. Remember the midnight sittings and protests at the legislature while trying to cut Toronto City Council? Or the autism protests that forced the government to backtrack? A lot of these people or more recently, mayors, many of whom are Tories, building public pressure on Ford to reverse retroactive cuts to municipalities. Doug Ford's priorities are out of whack with Ontarians' priorities. And while Ford campaigned on putting money back in people's pockets, the government spent money fighting the federal carbon tax in court and is facing a possible lawsuit from the beer store. And in a surprise move, the government decided not to sit again until the end of October, after the federal election. The more people see Doug Ford, at least this is what I hear, the less they like Andrew Scheer. Either Mr. Ford uh, wants to be available to uh, campaign for uh, Andrew Scheer, or Andrew Scheer's asking Doug Ford to hide under a rock. The government says it has it's nothing to do with that. So we've been very, very busy, and, and now it's time to uh, sit down, go back and talk to uh, our, our stakeholders, go back and talk to our constituents. I reached out to Andrew Scheer's office, and they maintain they did not reach out to the PCs to tell them to lay low until after the federal election. They used to grace magazine covers together, appeared on stage last fall, but with Ford's popularity plummeting in recent polls and the fact Alberta Premier Jason Kenney is coming to Ontario to campaign with the federal Conservative leader, it's tough not to at least question why the Ontario legislature is not sitting for another five months. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. One of the government's last orders of business announcing an expansion to beer and wine sales in the province. The government is promising to open hundreds more locations to sell alcohol by next spring. But what about that contract with the beer store Lisa just mentioned? Lorena Redekop has more. Mr. Yakubuski. Yakubuski. Mr. Hardin. On this final day of the legislative session, the Ford government voted to end the contract with the beer store. And from the opposition, once again, criticism. It's so concerning that this government is ripping up contracts and ignoring the rule of law, all for beer. Then the finance minister traveled to a grocery 
grocery store in North York with more news on the booze file. There will be nearly 300 new retail outlets selling beverage alcohol across Ontario. Some of those will be wine and beer outlets at grocery stores like this one. 200 others, smaller LCBO agency stores with the new name of LCBO convenience outlets. We have a once in a generation opportunity to make meaningful change in the way alcohol is sold, purchased and consumed across Ontario. And let us assure you, this is just the beginning. Question. The finance minister took few questions on details. And the opposition keeps reminding people that ending the beer store contract could cost the province. We're about to waste hundreds of millions of dollars so that the Ford government can proudly continue to be the, uh, you know, the beer mongers of Ontario. The opposition parties also worry all this focus on beer is a distraction. I think if Doug Ford and the Conservatives spent even one-tenth of the time they spend on beer and alcohol on children and families, our province would be way better off. In a release, the beer store notes that while this act has now been passed by the legislature, it still hasn't been proclaimed into law. The beer store says it remains committed to negotiating amendments to the agreement. For it to become law, it needs to be proclaimed by the Lieutenant Governor. It's unclear when that might happen. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. You might remember this from last year. Today, a lawyer for the BC man accused of swimming naked in the shark tank at Ripley's Aquarium was in a Toronto court. Aside from a mischief charge over the aquarium incident, David Weaver is also charged with assault, causing bodily harm. Police allege he assaulted a man outside medieval times on the same night. Weaver's lawyer says his client has returned to British Columbia to resume his job as a fishing guide. He's trying to have the charges against his client split into two separate trials. How many pieces of microplastic does the average Canadian consume a year? 10,000? 50,000? It's actually much more than that. Still ahead, how much and how it could be affecting our bodies. That's coming up in just a few minutes. Coming up right now, the popular Colette Kennedy bringing us news of more sunshine. I don't know. I guess I am popular when the weather's good, right? <laughs> yeah, it's nice. I'll take it in. Uh, I want you to take in what's going on with the temperatures across the country. And, and there's a method behind my madness here, why I want to show this. But kind of bookend on both coasts, we're talking about seeing those temperatures a little cooler in the teens or upper teens. We know we've had a lovely day here today. I just want to draw your attention back here towards the belly of the country. Hopefully the prairies don't mind being told or called that in Winnipeg, 27 degrees. It's only 23 in Thunder Bay, but it's going to be spiking closer to those upper 20s, near 30, or at least feeling near 30 tomorrow. So actually, northwestern Ontario, they're talking about a heat warning in place for Friday and Saturday that's been issued by Environment Canada. And that's important because some of this weather eventually makes its way towards us. I'm not saying we're going into temperatures like that. We are not. But we do have a few days with that high pressure in place where we're going to see dry conditions and warm conditions as well. Putting it all in perspective in terms of the average high for us at this time of year, 22.4, and that's just about where uh, we've been through the day today. We're sitting at 22 right now. Really nice readings all around the lower Great Lakes. Nothing to really worry about at all, unless you're traveling further towards the north. Northeastern Ontario is where the showery activity is. We stay in these dry conditions with very few clouds, a little bit over the lakes, but we stay into these conditions not only through overnight today and tonight and into tomorrow, but also through Saturday. And it looks like at least a good portion of Sunday. I'll show you the five-day forecast and uh, walk you through that. Overnight tonight, 11 to 12 degrees in most cases. St. Catharines, you might be slightly milder, but tomorrow we're looking at those temperatures ranging from 23 to 25 with those sunny skies. Here's what goes on, and this is still a few days out, so that's why I'm watching it very carefully, but it really is starting to seem like this next system is going to pause and wait till the end of the weekend so that we get a nice dry period. Canadian Open is on through this weekend, all kinds of things uh, that you'll want to be doing, and then showers coming back at the beginning of next week. But the string of temperatures, Dwight, that should make me popular too, I hope. 
you're already popular without the nice temps, but man, that weekend is looking good, Colette. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, you're most welcome. As we head to break, here's a look at where the market's closed today. Stay with us. We will be right back. North Americans eat, drink, and breathe in tens of thousands of tiny particles of plastic every year. That's the conclusion of a new study, and while the researchers say they're not trying to scare people, there is reason to be concerned. Health reporter Christine Birak explains. Uh-oh, I see a piece of garbage. These third graders are checking out the water in their local creek. Can we see anything in it? Mm, yeah. Kind of like little stuff. They're looking for evidence of plastic in the water. The plastic could start breaking down into tinier pieces. She's right. Microplastics smaller than a grain of rice then end up inside us. So how many do you think we take in every year? If you had to take a wild guess. 3 million 500. 1,000. 1, oh yeah, that was my 18,000? Canadian researchers examine 26 studies and estimate the average adult consumes between 70 and 121,000 pieces of microplastic every year. And the study only looked at a sampling of items, seafood, tap water, bottled water, beer and our air. Researchers also found those who drink mostly bottled water may be gulping down an extra 90,000 pieces a year. The question is, how much is too much for our bodies to handle? We know that there is some hazard based on the potential for health impacts, but we really don't know the actual likelihood of those health impacts occurring. While we don't yet know what microplastics are doing to our health, marine biologists are seeing the effects of micro and large plastics in other living things, including whales. We know that in some cases, uh, plastic items can suffocate, can artificially satiate, make an animal think it's had a belly full of food when in fact it's not getting any nutri nutrition at all. In a variety of fish and bird species, scientists say microplastics can prevent adequate nutrition, reduce growth, reduce reproductive capabilities, and alter behavior. But experts warn it's not easy to study the effects of microplastics alone. We have fish and invertebrates and seabirds that are exposed to microplastics, macroplastics, pesticides, flame retardants, metals, hydrocarbons, pharmaceuticals, the rest. So the real world, unfortunately, is a very uh, challenging place to work. So tell us what you put in the filter, Maxwell. Charcoal, sand, and gravel. As scientists try to pull apart the impacts of microplastics, they say Canadians shouldn't be alarmed. But add, given the unknowns, we should be looking for ways to reduce plastic use. Would you drink that water? No. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Scarborough isn't always portrayed in a positive light on the news, and the students here at Brookside Public School have been bugging me for months saying, listen, we are doing a We Love Scarborough Day, and we want you to come to our school to celebrate. So coming up, what We Love Scarborough Day is all about here at Brookside. My name is Matea Soto, I'm 12 years old, and I met with Captain Scott Brown, who was 96 and a veteran of World War II with the Gordon Highlanders, about his experiences on D-Day and what it was like as an officer leading his men into battle. I was a part of what they call an infantry battalion, and an infantry battalion is roughly 1,200 men. It's a lot of men. And our objective was two radar stations on Gold Beach. You have to know your men, you have to know how they're going to react and what their beliefs are. And you have to have their faith in you, which is very difficult to get. And it's your job to make sure you bring him home alive. Why do you feel it's important for people to remember the sacrifices and 
the lives of soldiers during World War II. Because a lot of my friends died for it. War is dangerous, it's costly, and it's brutal. Good lessons there. Ceremonies were held all across Canada today, marking the 75th anniversary of D-Day. But this year, the main commemoration was not held at the National War Memorial in Ottawa. Instead, it was held in Halifax. Our Brett Ruskin explains why. Well, this was another commemoration ceremony here, the largest ceremony on Canadian soil to remember the largest seaborne invasion in history. And so it happened here in Halifax, where so many Canadians traveled to from coast to coast, taking trains here seven decades ago to arrive here in Halifax to board ships and head overseas to war. And to signify and represent that journey, there were boots, military boots that traveled on trains, in fact, the furthest coming from Vancouver, but another 10 pairs or so coming from all across the country. Now, they came here to uh, represent that transit that many soldiers make made to come here to Halifax to board ships and head overseas. Now, there were so many poignant moments in this ceremony. Here's just a few of them. And we must remember the lives that were lost, the bodies that were wounded. But first and foremost, we must remember that working together is our hope for the future. And there was one point where one of the veterans, in fact, read the act of remembrance. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. In the historical records that I've looked at, we had 126 men that joined and two women. We lost five. And now as this ceremony wraps up, this is likely one of the largest and last major ceremonies uh, marking the anniversary of D-Day in which there will still be veterans alive. And so the task now is for the next generation to ensure that this story, that this account of what happens now moves from living memory to the pages of history. Brett Ruskin, CBC News, Halifax. We have more on today's D-Day anniversary for you online, including this look at how astronomy played a role in setting June 6th as the landing day. You can find it at cbcnews.ca and the CBC News app. It was a plan to ease congestion and get the city's traffic flow ready for the future. This week on Throwback Toronto, we take a look at the highway that never was, the Spadina Expressway. one of the most difficult issues, certainly, that the government has dealt with in some time. This week in Toronto in 1971, the controversial Spadina Expressway project was cancelled. Here's what was planned, a highway that would stretch from the 401 down Spadina Road south through Forest Hill to pass Bloor. And by 1971, it was complete to Lawrence and partially complete to Eglinton. But funding had almost run out. And there was vocal opposition from Forest Hill residents who lived where the expressway was supposed to run through, and also from activists like Jane Jacobs. Expressways cutting through cities and cutting through the neighborhoods and destroying them um, are very destructive to cities. So the Bill Davis government pulled their support, killing the project. And the determination was made by the government to uh, say no to the expressway. And that portion that was complete is now the Allen Expressway. And East End schools celebrated something other than the Raptors today. The students came together to celebrate their community. They created trivia games and actually all kinds of games, and it all revolved around Scarborough vibes. They said, Mr. Drummond, you better come to our school and help us celebrate Scarborough. So I did. All right. Sachin, we're going to start with you, buddy. How did this turn into this? 
we started off as a small class business, and then we were like having struggles coming up with this idea. Actually, like we were going all around the places, and then we finally came up with coming up with the calendar because we thought, oh, since like people always generalize Scarborough as like a place where it's bad things happen, criminal activity, we thought that showing people that actually there's like a good light in Scarborough would enlighten them to what we feel is the typical place to live. Yeah, it's a proper presentation of the community. This is a very cool community. You guys like living in Scarborough? Yeah! There we go. Hey, Selena, are you in charge over here? Yes. All right, what's happening with the young ones here? They're trying to spell Scarborough as best as they can, and they're using teamwork to work together to try to spell it. I like it. How are you guys doing? Is this how you spell Scarborough? Yeah! Good job. You know, what's this station all about? So, pretty much what's going to happen is we're going to give each student a heart. Yeah. And, the, and we're going to blindfold them so yeah. that they can't see. And, and then, over here on the Mount Scarborough. Oh, so like pin the tail on the donkey, you're going to yeah. pin the heart on Scarborough. Yeah. All right, help me. What do I do, you guys? Straight this way? Yeah. Okay. Straight? Help. Keep going, keep going. Down, down. Oh, 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 oh. Right there. No. No, 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 no. no, no, no. Okay, 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 okay. You cheated. Where, where, where? Help. You cheated. Up or down? Which of these sports is the most popular in Scarborough? Lacrosse, soccer, hockey, or Toronto Raptors basketball? Okay, what was the answer? What's the answer? What's the answer? Uh, yeah. Toronto Raptors basketball? Yeah, I Did I get it right? Is it basketball? Who's going to win the NBA championship this year? Raptors! That's an easy question. That's an easy question. All right. Big shout out to Brookside Public School for having awesome. me today. Okay, we're running out of time. You have to wrap up the forecast in one word this week and call it. I'm going to give you sunshine. If I could have another word, though, it'd be mild. Sunshine about <laughs> That's it. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a great day, everybody. Look at that Oakland. We're going to...